last week, uh, last week we looked at the, the battle for your time and your attention and how largely in the West, in Adelaide in 2022, we have, <clears throat> we've uh, given up the fight. We haven't even joined in the battle for our attention and how we need to firstly understand there is a battle for our attention going on and how can we actually get into the battle and actually uh, be victorious in the battle for your attention and for your time. Today, we're going to be looking at hurry, rushingness and, rushingness, that's not a word, uh, rushing and presence and how we can be more present wherever we are um, rather than having a mind full of everything else that needs to be done uh, and rushing from place to place. So um, let me pray and then we'll get stuck into the scriptures today. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for this time together. Thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus. Thank you for your presence with us always by your spirit. We're so thankful that you never leave us, never forsake us, don't abandon us. Be with us all the time. And Father, as we uh, look into your scriptures today, um, we need your help. We certainly want to understand more about um, presence and how to be present. And as we look to the example of Jesus and look to live in the power of his spirit, would you help us to have the same kind of peaceful presence that Jesus had all the time? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, studies, research has found that the wealthier a nation is or a culture is, the wealthier they are, the more individualistic that country or culture tends to be. I don't know whether it's the wealth that leads to the individualism or the individualism that leads to the wealth, but that's for a different sermon. Uh, but what they found was the more individualistic a culture is, the, the faster those people walk. So the more individualistic, the more wealthy, the faster people walk. And Australia has one of the fastest walking people in the world. Did you know that? <clears throat> in fact, we are the, either the first or the second, depending on how you look at it, the richest nation of individuals in the world. Not the richest nation in the world, but if you tally up the median individual, we are the first or second richest nation of individuals in the world and one of the richest people who has ever, ever existed, but by, um, by average. We walk really fast because we've got places to go, people to see. Uh, we're in a hurry to get there. Uh, we're one of the worst countries in the world for road rage, have been for like 20 years. Ever since road rage was a thing, we've been one of the worst countries in the world. Uh, because I'm in a hurry and you're in a hurry and you, act, you know, acting in line with your hurry is getting in the way of me getting in, into my hurry and where I need to go and where I need to go fast and I get very angry about that because I'm in a hurry, man. Uh, we're all in a hurry. Uh, it's a shocker. There's not enough time to do what we need to do and it takes a lot of time to get there and even though we live in Adelaide, we can go across town in 20 minutes usually, uh, we still get in a real hurry Getting places. We don't even have time to indicate. That's how much of a hurry South Australians are. In our, script, in our scriptures today, <clears throat> we're going to see Jesus. In fact, we're going we're gonna, to like, camp in a scripture today, but we're going to see, even throughout scripture, um, look at Jesus and his approach to hurry, his approach to presence, how he was, wherever he went, <clears throat> uh, he was fully engaged where he was with the people he was with all the time, fully engaged. He'd talk about the future, but he always lived where he was. And we're going to see how is this both a, an example, a model, and even a calling for us uh, to live into that same kind of peaceful presence that Jesus had. Today we'll see Jesus not hurrying on his way to a dying girl and not hurrying when he's interacting with someone who's interrupted him on his way. We see no hurry. So let me read this for you. It's from Luke 8. Very famous passage of scripture. Uh, we, could, we could preach many different kinds of sermons and pull out and extract lots of different things that are going on in this passage. Today we're going to look at peaceful presence. 
So when Jesus returned, he had been there, he had gone, he had come back. The crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. I mean, how could he hurry? How could he rush? Uh, Crowds all, all, all around him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid. Only believe and she'll be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, James and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her, but he said, stop crying because she's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, child, get up. Her spirit returned and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. So here we have an account of uh, Jesus interacting with actually a bunch of people, a whole crowd of people. Um, Jairus, this very important person in his culture, uh, a couple of Jairus' servants, Jairus' daughter, this 12-year-old girl, and a woman who for the same period of time as this young woman's life, this young girl's life, had, had had a medical issue that she had spent all of her money and even all of her cultural capital trying to solve. So she would have been a an unclean person in their culture, even perhaps an outcast, someone who people would have looked at as, well, you're either being punished by God or abandoned by God because he's left you in your distress. And this man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my daughter is dying. She's 12, my only daughter. You can save her. He has, he has faith in Jesus, at least that he could help. He's heard that Jesus has helped and healed people before. Jesus, please come and save my daughter. And let me tell you, Jairus, he would have been in a hurry. Um, if only Jesus could get there before she dies. With this limited window of time to achieve this goal, I've got to get it done now. And so he comes. It might have even been an embarrassment to him, the leader of the synagogue, like the holy guy in his town. I need outside help to go and get Jesus. He's in a hurry. No one could help her. She lay dying. Uh, Jesus, sorry, Jairus wasn't the only one who had heard of Jesus. This other woman, she'd heard, obviously heard of Jesus. Uh, all these massive crowds that were around, they'd obviously heard of Jesus as well. Uh, very popular guy, because he can help me. Uh, if I need healing, he can help me. He wanted to see if, sorry, she wanted to see if Jesus could save him. She was desperate, marginalized, unclean, outcast. If she could just get to Jesus, she might be healed. What a setup, what a story. Um, and not just physically being healed, but this would have like, changed her life. She would have gone from unclean to clean, from outcast to included, from on the margins to in the community. It was a big, big deal for her. So her figurative life is on the line. Jairus' daughter's physical life is on the line. It's high stakes. You'd expect that Jesus, in this scenario, he'd be in a hurry, right? <clears throat> If you heard about this woman, hurry to go save her and hear about Jairus, daughter, let's go as quick as we can, let's boost. And when the woman reaches out to touch Jesus' hand, she's instantly healed. And Jesus, on the way to help a dying daughter, stops. Imagine Jairus in this moment. And Jesus, we don't have time. Power's gone out from you. Awesome, dude. Let's see that again. Come to my house. Let's go for it. And Jesus stops Jairus, I'm imagining, just his heart going, what the heck, mate? 
but he needs Jesus, so he can't, can't have a go. And Jesus stops, turns around, asks, inquires. No one owns up. He says, I know that something has happened. I, I know power has been out from me. What, who, who is it? What's going on? Jesus finds this woman. She tells him and everybody the story. I'm an outcome unclean. I'm an outcast. I just knew if I could just get to Jesus, then I would be healed. And I was healed. She knew she'd been healed. Jesus knew that power had gone out from him. <clears throat> and he takes time and he calls her daughter. He says, daughter. He's saying, you're my family. That's a term of endearment. She might have been about the same age as him even. Might have been. And he says, you're... You're clean, you're welcome, you're family, you're included, and you're healed. It takes time. He's not on Jairus's clock. He's not on the woman's clock. He's not on Peter's clock. Peter's like, dude, what do I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, about 30 people have touched you in the last one minute. We're not going to find this person. This is not COVID safe. Um, but Jesus has time for this woman. And just then, as Jesus has, has paused already, <clears throat> the reports come from one of Jairus' helpers. Oh, Jairus, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's died. And Jairus, man, I wonder what he's thinking. He's thinking, Jesus, we weren't that far. If you had just hurried, if you had just come quicker, she might not have died. I wonder um, if you, like Jairus, have ever felt that God's been too late to the party. Oh God, if you just acted sooner. If you just knew what I knew, God, you wouldn't have let this thing happen. Uh, my daughter or my son's life was on the line and you didn't show up. You don't have to believe in God to yell at God and say, why God? Jesus tells him not to fear goes to the daughter's lifeless body, tells her to get up, um, brings her back to life just with his words, and everyone is rightly astounded. They've gone from laughing at him to laughing with joy. Laughing like, good on you, Jesus. I don't think you know, like, where'd you get your medical training again? Uh, you say she's not dead. Uh, to tears of laughter and joy. What does this tell us about Jesus? What can we learn about hurry? Uh, firstly, we can see that, again, Jesus doesn't rely on anybody else's timing but his own. In fact, he says, I don't do anything to the Father tells me. Uh, I'm not beholden to your timing. I'm not beholden to my timing. <clears throat> There's one time when um, uh, Jesus' mum comes to him and says, hey, Jesus, we've run out of wine at this uh, wedding. Can you do something? And he's like, come on, mum, you know, it's not yet my time. He still helps him out. Uh, but he is not beholden to their timing. He's on his way to Jairus' daughter, but takes the time to stop and help this poor woman. She, again, she was an outcast, lonely, margins of society, probably in pain, but Jesus doesn't ignore her. He loves her. He recognizes her. <clears throat> this one who would have been ignored by everybody else. All the people from her town would have known who she was, what her story is, would, have, would not have even seen her, perhaps. And Jesus doesn't just see her, he recognizes her, calls her daughter, like welcomes him. Jesus was never in a hurry. He was always exactly where he intended to be, doing exactly what he wanted to do. It's true in his earthly ministry that we read in the Gospels. It's true now. He's not slow. He's not delayed. He's not distracted. He is exactly on time and he's not too busy for you, ever. Sometimes we get this kind of picture of, our, of ourselves as someone, like in, in the grand scheme of the entire universe, how inconsequential we are in terms of just this one little <clears throat> squishy bag of kind of meat and bones uh, in, in the context of the entire universe throughout all of time. And we are here for just a little, like a breath, the scripture says, like vapor. And so small and so short, and yet God recognizes you and God calls you daughter or son invites you into his family no matter how 
sought after you are or overlooked you are by a culture that um, looks for success or money or good looks or giftedness. No matter where you stand in, in culture's rankings, uh, God sees you and he loves you. Even when it seemed like he was arriving too late for Jairus' daughter, Jesus is never too late. It might be too late by our reckoning, might be too late by our plans. It might be too late in, t- in terms of our goal is to not suffer, our goal is to not have hardship. Um, that's not the same as God's goals for us. God's goals for us are holiness, sanctification, Christ-likeness, and eternal life. I don't know if you've ever noticed, <clears throat> while reading the Gospels, uh, Jesus is never in a hurry. He never runs. Never says Jesus, like, picked up his bags and, and ran because he was running late. Never mentions that. Never says, well, Jairus' daughter was almost dead, and so he knew there was a time limit, and so he bolted. No, he, he never runs. He always walks. For us, if we're going to walk with Jesus, we need to learn to walk. With Jesus. It's one of the things we're going to look at today. We need to quit our addiction to hurry and walk with Jesus. So how do we do this? How do we practice presence like Jesus? How do we avoid the rush, <clears throat> quit our addiction to busy? Now, this is what Proverbs says, uh, desire without knowledge is not good and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. When we rush, we fail. I'm not saying we shouldn't have ambition, not saying we shouldn't be passionate, not saying we shouldn't like run, like actually physically run. That's, that's probably good for us. Um, what I'm saying is we need to quit hurry. We feel, we, no, I don't say we feel, I don't want to generalize. It is easy to fill our lives with so much that in the rush to keep up with it all it becomes hard to actually be present wherever we are. Actually, we're not like Jesus in practicing peaceful presence when we fill our lives with too much stuff. We have to, we don't even have time to get to the things that we need to do, let alone actually do those things. So when you're at home, you're busy thinking or worrying about work. When you're at work, you're thinking about, oh, I'd much rather be doing my hobbies. When you're with your hobbies, you're stressed because, oh man, I should be hanging out with my family. Uh, when you're with your wife or your neighbor or your kids, you keep checking your phone because your phone keeps beeping at you. Bzz, bzz, someone's doing something exciting or important. I need to go check what that thing is. When you're at church, you're thinking about lunch or sport. I wonder who's winning the game at the moment or whatever's next. We're continually living in the next thing we need to do. So we do really poorly at just being present where we're at. It's very easy to be consumed with what's next or everything else that's happening in a way that prevents us from actually practicing a peaceful presence. I don't mean for that to be to have alliteration, but there you go. Jesus gets interrupted all the time. <clears throat> is there at a party and a Pharisee says, hey, Jesus, what about this? Or he's on his way somewhere. And someone comes to Jesus and says, hey, hey, Jesus, can you help me out with, with this? Or <clears throat> he's on his way to Jairus' daughter and a woman comes and touches him. He's, he, he's teaching some people and these little kids run up to him and say, hey, Jesus, how you doing? Uh, he's consistently, constantly being interrupted. And yet, we, I mean, we can't exclude all interruptions from our lives, obviously. Um, but we can exclude or minimize the interruptions we invite into our lives, which prevent that peaceful presence. So it's not like we're just being interrupted by things we can't control. We are being interrupted by things we can control. We need to eliminate, we need to abandon, jettison, uh, quit our, like break up with our relationship with busyness and hurry. Secondly, uh, we need to understand we really suck at multitasking. We think we're good at multitasking or you might think, well, I'm I know most people aren't good, but I'm one of the very few people who are good at multitasking. Actually, research shows, I uh, read in Psychology Today, research shows the better you think you are at multitasking, probably the worse you are at multitasking. <laughs> this is what they found. That's what the studies say. 97.5% of us are terrible at multitasking. That's pretty much everybody is terrible at multitasking. Because uh, we actually can't multitask at all. Uh, well, they, they say it's not multitasking, we are serially switching tasks. We're just serial task switching. 
So we're going, well, we're here, we're there, we're here, we're there. We're actually not doing two things at once, not well. <coughs> uh, we, again, research, uh, Dr. Jim Taylor from uh, Uni of San Francisco, he researched the research and he said, we can do menial tasks, two things at once. We can listen to the radio and fold washing. Uh, or if we've developed a habit over hundreds and hundreds of hours, we might be able to do a more complex task, two at a time. But when it comes to thinking, listening, responding, critically analysing, especially listening and thinking at the same time, or listening and speaking at the same time, or any of those higher order tasks, <coughs> executive functions or control tasks, you like to call them, uh, we can't do those two, two at a time. What happens is, when we try to, we do both of them poorly. And so we think we're good at, you know, keeping the plates spinning. We're actually terrible at it. I'll get hits more on that research, but no time to go through it. We don't excel at anything when we multitask. All we do is add stress to our life. So we're actually removing peace when we try to multitask or fill our lives with more and more stuff. We think we're missing out. We think we're going to be more fruitful by adding more and more. In actual fact, we are detracting from our fruitfulness, detracting from our joy, and preventing a peaceful presence where we are. Thirdly, we need to embrace the thing that God has put in front of us. Like, where are we now? If we have recognised that there's a battle for our attention, like last week, recognised that we're addicted to busy, we're in a relationship with busyness, we need to break up with busyness. We've realized that we are bad at multitasking and yet we've stacked our lives with stuff that we are expecting to successfully multitask. And so we want to quit a bunch of the things that are crowding out practicing a peaceful presence. Thirdly, then, uh, if we're going to engage with the thing that God has put in front of us, how do we do that? What does that look like? There's this story I recorded in Luke 10. <clears throat> um, I'll just read the story. While they were traveling, this is Jesus and his disciples, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. They become really awesome friends. Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. They become like, like family. They're really, really good mates. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to give me a hand. I don't know if you've been in this kind of situation before where you're like, my sibling isn't helping. Hopefully it was much, much, much like years ago when you were much younger than you are today. Uh, help, get them to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. There are loads of important things to do. You could actually fill up your day and never, ever get around to all of the important things that there are to do. But there aren't all important things for you to do, necessarily. We, we could fill millions of lives with all of the important things that we like to do, and we do. That's why we need a whole community, a whole culture. That doesn't mean that you need to do every important thing. The tough part is knowing the priority of importance. Mary prioritizes being with who she's with. She's practicing that peaceful presence with Jesus who also and always practices that peaceful presence. Martha prioritized making it an Instagram-worthy night. Now, someone's got to serve the food, otherwise the food doesn't get served, right? Jesus is saying, let's prioritize the priority, which is togetherness. This is one of the things that comes up every single time. Beck and I do pre-marriage training with couples who are about to get married. <clears throat> uh, we hit this point where we're starting to talk about the wedding uh, and we get to talk about some of our favourite weddings that Beck and I have been to. We've been to lots and lots and lots of weddings uh, and genuinely the, the most simple Weddings we've been to have been the most amazing and joyful ones. Actually, headings we bring up you guys all the time. Props. 
abandoning the let's make this look awesome for everyone and practicing a presence of what an amazing day this is. But what about every day? What about every interaction we have with people? I mean, everyone who interacts with Jesus has an amazing day. Even the Pharisees, it's amazing. It's not awesome because they get continually like beat down, but it's still awesome. It's still amazing. Quick survey I did uh, during the week for some practical things that we can help in our fight for our attention and to be present where we are and to practice that peaceful presence where we are. Here, here's a list. I'll post this list later, but uh, this is just some of the things practically we can do to, like Jesus, be where he has placed us with the people with whom he has placed us. Uh, things like this. At the beginning of the day, take a couple of minutes to fully engage with your spouse before leaving the house rather than just whoosh, running out the door. Family prayers, maybe, before, as you start the day, family prayers. We used to do uh, family psalms, so a psalm, read a psalm every day, uh, and then pray. We still pray with the kids every day. Uh, and at the end of the day, here's, this is one I've found very helpful, if, like as you pull up to the house, uh, if, if you pull up to the house, uh, before you get out, spend a couple of minutes in the car just thanking God for the day or, or asking God to help you practice a peaceful presence as you walk in the house rather than getting home and rushing in the house, perhaps to an empty house or a spouse who has had a difficult day and you're bringing your difficult day. Of course, I mean, share about your day, bear one another's burdens. Uh, but take those minutes to go, all right, work day is done. I can't actually do anything about that now. As I walk in the door, it's home time now. Things like turning off all phone app notifications can be super helpful. Just eliminate interruptions. Don't invite interruptions, eliminate interruptions. Or someone at uh, my DG suggested, just delete all of the social media apps off of your phone. You're just gone. Don't get, you don't have to silence notifications. There aren't any notifications. Uh, write down all your tasks, get them out of your mind. One of the other things that uh, I was reading up on when talking about multitasking is <clears throat> our brains, our minds are awesome at processing data and pretty average at storing data, and yet we try to use them to, to store heaps of data. And so we kind of fill it up with stuff or got to remember all my tasks, but that, all you're doing then is consistently bringing to mind these tasks that you've got to do that aren't the thing that you're currently doing. But you get them out of your mind, you train your mind to not have to continually, like it's like your own internal notification system. You don't have to do that because you know they're written down somewhere. Uh, take time to observe things. Just a tree, a kid, uh, a cloud. There's another one from our DG. Don't observe kids at the playground unless they're there with a kid. Um, set some house rules like no phones at dinner time, no multitasking at home. Start the day 30 minutes earlier. So just get up 30 minutes earlier. Actually give more time to your day. I mean going to bed earlier as well. Or leave when you need to go somewhere. Leave five minutes earlier so you're not in traffic, I mean you are traffic, but don't leave in traffic frustrated and worried and stressing about getting there or being in a hurry and road raging because you left with more time to get there. That's from my wife every single day to me. <clears throat> uh, eat slowly and together is another one. Actually be together with the people with whom you're together. Uh, eliminate the non-essential, meditate. And by that I don't mean that like an Eastern philosophy kind of way where you try to empty your mind. I mean, in a biblical kind of way where the Bible tells us over and over and over again, meditate on this, meditate on this, meditate on this. We actually fill our minds with scripture. Get used to focusing on a thing, an element of God's character, our one scripture, and sit in it for a very long time, become disciplined in the focus of that one thing, not emptying your mind, but filling it with the thoughts of God. This might sound like I'm just hipping us with more and more things to do. In actual fact, it's trying to get rid of a lot of things that might be important. Like, it's important <clears throat> to know what's going on in the world, uh, but we could become so um, focused on that or encompassed by that that we're consistently filling our minds with news we don't really need to know. Uh, we want to become more and more like Jesus, and we, again, see Jesus doesn't run, doesn't rush, always focused on the people who he's with. And you might think, 
Now, it's a little bit unfair to compare ourselves to Jesus because he is fully man, but also fully God, right? So he's on his way to Jairus' daughter and he knows she's about to die and he has time for the woman there because he knows even if he's late, he can just rock up later and raise her from the dead. In fact, when it comes to Lazarus, Mary and Martha's brother, <clears throat> when he word comes that he's sick, Lord, quickly come. Your really good mate, Lazarus, is about to die. He gets on the fastest horse and rushes there. No, he says, all right, no worries. Let's wait here a couple days. Jesus, your really good mate is super, super sick. Please come heal him. Absolutely. That's very important. We're going to hang out here for a couple of days. He always knew what to say, always made time to say it. The woman at the well, again, another person who was at the well at a time when nobody else was there, uh, not particularly well thought of person, perhaps, and he takes time to engage with this, with this woman. Syrophoenician woman takes time to engage with the woman. Disciples are saying, get out of here, woman. And Jesus is there taking time to, to be with them. Uh, for us, man, we are in such a hurry because we've crowded our life full of stuff. We can't stop for the people. We barely make eye contact with um, like cashiers or sales assistants who help us out with things, let alone ask them how the day is going, that kind of stuff. Uh, barely do that with the people who are most meaningful and important with us, for some, for some people. Truth is, we can't be there for everyone, always. We can't stop for the woman and be there in time for Jairus' daughter, like Jesus can. Uh, it's actually impossible for us. And that's also kind of the point. We want to become more like Jesus in practicing a peaceful presence and also understand that we aren't God. We actually can't be there for everyone. It's actually one of the things we need to know in, to enable us to say no to things because we're not Jesus. We want to become more and more like him. We want to follow in his example, but we can't be present with everyone always. That's the point. But God is present with everyone always. He is with you always. When you're at your best, God is there. When you're at your worst, God is there. When you groan with the difficulties of suffering in life, the Spirit, Scripture tells us, the Spirit groans with us. God is with you, always. You might have heard it said, <clears throat> uh, when you sin, God is far from you. You need to overcome your sin and come back to him. Uh, no. no, no, that's not true. It is true that our sin separates us from God, but that's what Jesus came to overcome. There is, again, Scripture tells us, no gap between us and God anymore. There's no distance. There's no separation. There's only union and unity. Sin separates us from God, but when we sin now, he is faithful to forgive. He is the one who draws us back to repentance. He's the one that invites us back to him always because he's always there with us. The only time Scripture gives us a picture of Jesus running, like there's one time, kind of, in a parable, where Jesus gives this parable about the prodigal son, <clears throat> And the prodigal son, this extravagant, wasteful, rebellious son, represents us, in, in, in a sense. And the father in the story represents God. And the only time Jesus tells a story about him rushing is when the son comes to repentance and the father like, girds up his loins, like grabs his robe, wraps it around, and bolts to the son who he loves. That's the time that God runs. He's never in a hurry other than when he's rushing to a repenting son or daughter. And this is God's disposition to us as well. Uh, he is the one running towards us with love, welcoming us into his family, but not rushing because he's in a hurry because if he doesn't get there in time, he won't get his way. So we don't shy away from some menacing God. 
uh, we can come open arms, like life laid bare to a God who always has open arms to us, who's always there with us. We, like the bleeding woman, reach out to God full of hope that he can help, help us in our greatest need and is always faithful. And that always faithful doesn't look like an always healing. Always faithful doesn't look like a always living. Always faithful doesn't look like a <clears throat> um, like things going your way, the relationship being restored, the baby surviving. But it always looks like God with us. He's not an absent father. He never walks out on his family. Uh, he is always with us and he invites us to walk with him today. Let's walk with him. Let's not run ahead of him. Let's not fill our lives thinking we need to be God. Uh, let's fill our lives with practicing a peaceful presence in the few things God has put in front of us. In our DGs this week, we're going to look at <clears throat> what does this mean for us individually. We're going to look at what does this mean for us collectively. We're going to do some of the work of identifying what is in our life that we've kind of crowded uh, out um, as we break up with busyness. We're going to uh, do that work in community. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you again for your goodness and your kindness to us. Thank you for your great love towards us. Thank you for the example we have in Jesus, never rushing, never too busy for the things that you have um, given him to do because... You only give us the things to do that you want us to actually do and do well and be fruit, bear fruit in. And so, Father, would you help us to have wisdom and discernment, to listen to your spirit, to know what it is that is important for us to do, that you'd have us do. Walk in those good works you've prepared in advance for us. Help us to, uh, like Jesus, practice a peaceful presence Wherever we are, when we're at church, that we are here with the body. When we're with our family, we're there with our family. When we're at work, we are working as if to the Lord. Uh, when we're recreating or, or resting, we are resting really well because we haven't crowded our lives uh, with so much that we are crowding out fruitfulness. Help us to be peaceful in our minds and to encourage and, and bear with one another. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.